Good evening, everyone. This is the regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Estimate and Taxation, September 2009. You should have received um, a second revised agenda. We had some revisions, I guess, on Friday, and then again, one revision um, relative to new business uh, on Monday morning or Monday afternoon. Uh, before we get into our applications are routine and non-routine applications of which there are only two. Um, I would first like to introduce our superintendent of schools. Um, he, you know, they say he's new, but I think already this school year he's had to deal with a variety of issues. Um, but uh, please join me in a welcome of Dr. Sidney Freund, our superintendent of schools. Thank you, thank you for that greeting, and I, I hope we'll continue to applaud as we go through the budget process together, <laughs> and then we make some tough decisions. Um, I'm not sure if I'm, I'd rather be here this evening or I'm going next, which is New Lebanon, for a difficult conversation on uh, fourth and fifth grade class size and, and I, that I have uh, been dealing with, among other issues. I, I just wanted to come here to let you know that I am um, studying my numbers very, very carefully so that when, when we meet, um, I, will, I will be prepared. And um, I'm a team player. I understand that there will be guidelines and the parameters and um, some tough decisions to be made. As um, some of you have met with me already and heard, I, I, my first approach to solving problems is I don't throw money at them. I look for other solutions first. Um, and you have my assurance as I go through and build a budget that I'll do that very, very carefully and, and looking at whatever possibilities are. We know that there were significant reductions in, in the budget um, last year. And I don't know how many more rabbits there are to pull out of hats, but we're, we're looking. And we're looking for that. Um, but first and foremost, understand that my responsibility is, is to let everyone know what can be and what I think should be in terms of promoting education and, and our students, and then you'll tell me what will be. I understand that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I can say that I've had the pleasure of meeting with Dr. Freund a couple of times already going over um, not only budgets, but issues between our board and, and um, the chairman of the uh, Board of Ed is also here, Nancy Weisler, so I appreciate the, the time that was spent over the summer in, in terms of just getting ducks in a row. So thank you for the time spent. Item three now comes before us, consideration of applications. Uh, Madam Clerk, for our one routine application. Uh, yes, uh, routine applications. I move uh, CC1 for the uh, Conservation Department, an additional appropriation of $500. And again, I so move it. Moved by Ms. Tarkington, second by Mr. Mason. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? 11 0, 0 I should note at this time that Mr. Kelly is not with us tonight. He is on trial in California, uh, and um, that's taking a priority to this meeting. Uh, as I guess. A lawyer, not as a party. <laughs> uh, true. <laughs> the second uh, application item now comes before us non routine. Mr. Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. PW3 for Department of Public Works for $215,327. Additional appropriation for a VAC call, and I still move the item. It's been moved by Mr. Mason. Second by Mr. Simon. Uh, discussion. Mr. Mason. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is an additional interim request for $215,327 to replace our second VAC haul unit. VAC haul units are what we clean out our storm drains, and they're under the operation of the DPW uh, department and maintained by fleet. We have two current, currently we have two units. One is a 1992, and the other one is a 1993. Both have become be beyond economical repair. Last year, during our budget process, we appropriated money for one replacement that arrived this summer. So currently, the town has three in its possession. During the past nine months, we were renting a unit to the sum of $8,000 a month rather than defining the needs of the town. According to DPW, we outsource some of our drain cleaning work primarily for the very large catch basins. What makes this request so important is the town has about 11,000 catch basins, which we would like to clean annually, and it's difficult to do that even with two fully functional. Um, 
Lessons learned. We've had two units for 15 plus years. Both units exceeded the routine 10 year replacement cycle. We replaced one rather than two. Then we rented a unit while waiting for the new one to arrive, which might not have been the best fiscal move on behalf for the, for the town. The budget committee certainly recognizes the issues and needs uh, of the item and we supported it 4-0, uh, but we did want to make sure it was understood that it was a non-routine item because of the, this is a, a very serious issue, especially as the town is embarking on what could be $100 million in uh, drainage infrastructure uh, rebuilding. Thank you. Further discussions, we do have the commissioner of DPW here and the highway director. Did I get that title right? Highway superintendent. High, highway superintendent. Uh, here to answer any questions, um, as Mr. Mason indicated, uh, one of the uh, roles of the BET is to make sure that the public is educated as to what we do. Um, and this particular item uh, was worthy of simply not just passing it like the first application. Um, so we appreciate you being here tonight. Are there any other questions or, or does anyone uh, wish for the department to make <coughs> any comments relative to this application? Ms. Barton. I have one question. When we get the second machine, does that mean that we will now have two machines whose useful life will expire simultaneously at some point in the future? It's very likely because they're being bought in the same, same time frame. Um, one of the things I think that experience has taught us is we probably should reevaluate this <clears throat> earlier rather than later. So as it's coming into its midlife, I, I think a thorough examination for by the um, you know the fleet regime to really give it a, a passing grade, or should we uh, you know uh, put in money to keep this on the road, or should we trade it in? Maybe it would be somewhat less than 10 years, but at least we can get uh, the cycle going in, the, in that fashion. And, and one of the things I would think we could look at long term is making sure that gradually, not all at once, but gradually their terms get staggered so we're not replacing them two at a time every 10 years, but instead one every five years. We can only hope. <laughs> yep. But I don't mean no, by that, that to sense. wish that one of them breaks in five years. So. Right. Further comments or questions? All those in favor of PW3 signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. 11 0, 0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item 4 now comes before us. The assessor's report. Our town assessor, Ted Courtney. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, you have my report, uh, and I'll be glad to answer questions about it. Questions for the town assessor, Mr. Finger. Ted, um, item number six on your report, Senior Tax Deferral Study Committee. I believe you're a member of that committee? Yes, I was. Um, at the budget committee meeting last, last week, the town administrator briefed us on the then current thinking about the deferral program. I was just wondering if there's been any other meetings and further uh, thought as to what the specifics are going to be and if there's a timing on when this is going to be presented to the Board of Selectmen? <clears throat> we have what we hope is our final meeting on Thursday of this week at 8 a.m. And at that meeting, we're hoping to um, <coughs> vote on the final recommendation. I think that for the most part, it's been narrowed down and that we should uh, come to some agreement to put forward to the first Selectman by the end of this week. I had... Um Mr. Chairman, I had requested at the Budget Committee that the Town Administrator attempt to get a copy or a, a summary of the proposal to the BET prior to that time. Um, sounds like that is not likely to happen. Um, and I just want to express my disappointment if that is, in fact, the timing. Well, the <clears throat> I think that the ordinance has already been drafted, and we certainly have charts available. And I'm sure that these could be made available if you request them uh, from the, uh, the town administrator. I'm sure you make them available to you. Thank you. Well, just so I'm, I understand protocol, Ted, do you have a copy of, of the ordinance and the charts that are used as a backup to that? Uh, yes, I do. The ordinance gets redrafted each meeting, so I have copies of each of them. 
And following the meeting on Thursday morning, I'll have the final copy if you'd like me to forward it to, to, to everyone. Well, I think Mr. Finger, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but would like to see a copy of the last revision of the ordinance in the relevant charts so that if, in fact, he has any comments or, any, for that matter, anybody else on the BET would have comments before the committee were to make its final recommendations that he might be able to uh, suggest changes. I could uh, I could email tomorrow morning uh, the copy of the ordinance as it stands now, and the charts that uh, I've made available. I think that would be helpful. Okay. And then the final one. Miss Barton. Uh, I am a member of the working group and received as I walked in about five minutes ago a copy of the most recent charts and I'm concerned that that doesn't allow an awful lot of time between now and 8 o'clock Thursday morning for me, much less anyone who is a little less attuned to all of the discussions, to figure out what the ramifications of the program are and make any kind of intelligent decision. We, of course, do not have a copy of the current version of the ordinance as of yet. And I'm a little concerned that Thursday's meeting is coming in, you know, a day and a half. Unfortunately, I won't be able to be there, but I don't have the materials in hand even now to be able to uh, make a recommendation to anybody. So that that is our, our current posture, and I'm not entirely sure why we need to rush this through this Thursday, given the lateness of the material being available. Ted be standing behind you as the town administrator, so I'll let, I'll let him uh, respond. Uh, we'll be happy to give you what we have. Uh, the problem is what we have right this minute is not the final version. As of Thursday, we'll get hopefully much better, we'll get some sort of consensus. Nancy is correct. We just today uh, finished the spreadsheets. In fact, I haven't even reviewed them. I was, I was going to look at them tomorrow morning, and if they're all right, I'll send them out to the balance of the committee. Uh, the ordinance is not complete. Uh, Gene McLaughlin is doing the work. We're on to our third reiteration of the ordinance. Um, I'm hopeful by tomorrow we'll have something, but Gene also has other work that he has responsibilities for, and I can't guarantee it'll be ready. Uh, the reason we, we were in a... a um, I wouldn't say a rush mode, but in a mode that we're trying to get this thing done as soon as possible, is that we wanted to get it to the Board of Selectmen and to the BET, because ultimately it has to go to the RTM and be adopted probably no later than December, possibly no later than January, to be effective for next year's uh, tax roll. And we're starting to run out of time to give the RTM an opportunity to look at it also. Um, Hopefully, the document or the proposal that is put forth to the Board of Selectmen and ultimately to you will be something that uh, will not require any significant changes. If it does, we may not be able to make next year's timetable. But we'll try to get it out to you as soon as we have a copy that the committee is pretty much in agreement is what they would feel is appropriate. Uh, we're close. Ms. Tarkington and then Mr. Stone. <clears throat> I'd just like to make a comment here that last year when we did um, amend the senior tax relief, um, it came before the BET, I believe, at its December meeting and then went to the RTM in January. So it is possible to do a later schedule, though it then puts a lot of pressure on the sure. assessor's office, and we're all concerned about that since it reports to this board. I, I would comment that Ted has been extremely helpful on this project. I mean, he is to do these spreadsheets and also do other projects that are going on is very difficult. These spreadsheets are very complex. There's a lot of variables. And uh, typically, when you look at them, you can say, oh, shoot, there's another variable that we didn't really think out thoroughly in order to project what the cost or what the likely effect would be. And the other thing I would say is we have no experience. We're making our best judgment of what we think will happen based on a variety of dis different scenarios. The, uh, and I'd also mention that Peter's been also very helpful in, in analysing, uh, analysis of this and also on the spreadsheets. So. Mr. Stone and then Mr. Simon. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My uh, question concerns a different issue. So if there are any other questions concerning this item, I'll pass. Okay. Mr. Simon. Yeah, I think it's just important to 
emphasize the point that John made about the process, which is why it's not so important that we get to look at this ordinance by tomorrow or Thursday, because once the committee passes it, then the Board of Selectmen can change it or they can adopt it in any way they want, and then this board will review it, and we can change it and adopt it in any way we want, as we did with the senior tax relief, and then the RTM can also change it and adopt it in any way it sure. wants. So there's really like the first step along the process, and it's like the opening start. It's the opening statement, so I wouldn't worry so much if you find things that you don't like in this tax deferral program that we, we could just change them. Mr. Kramick. I think my concern, uh, having been a member of the task force that worked on the senior tax credit last time with, uh, with Leslie, we had a lot of meetings. We went into great detail. Um, we, a lot of the spade work uh, for um, the, the proposals that we made to the selectmen were done at the committee level by the task force. I get the sense that this is being rushed through the task force and that really uh, it's being rushed through at such a breakneck pace that the concepts are getting lost, which is how can we best help the seniors? I hear some things coming out of the task force. For example, uh, forcing seniors to give up tax credits if they participate in the deferral program, things like that. Uh, I also, when I ask about, well, what other community deferral programs have been looked at, I hear Westport, but I don't hear that there's really been a review of uh, a lot of uh, uh, the experience in other towns with deferral programs. And the reason why I bring that up is because um, the, that kind of work, that kind of research, that kind of spade work is better done at a task force level than it is when it comes up and we're looking at, 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 at great policy issues. Um, I don't, I don't uh, share your concern or feelings that we have rushed this through. We've been working on it every, virtually every week since the beginning of August. Uh, it's, this is a much simpler program than the... John, John. <laughs> since the beginning of August? Yes, that's right. Every, every week we've met on Thursday morning at 8 a.m. to work on it. Uh, the deferral program is much simpler than the credit program. Uh, one of the first decisions we talked about was to try to mirror the, the deferral program on the credit program. So we've, we've tried to use the same criteria. Uh, the deferral program is likely to be a much smaller component of uh, the, the services to our senior, primarily because of the lien issue. Uh, there are other, other issues. For instance, there's an interest rate on the money that's deferred which many seniors are likely to look at not as a positive uh, thing like the credit would be. So this isn't quite, it's not, it's not as large as a credit program. We suspect it'll be maybe 10% in terms of the financial impact. And the number of decisions that the committee had to uh, consider were significantly less than what we went through on the credit program. So I sat in on the same meetings you did on the credit program. So I don't think we've rushed it. I think we've had some good, good discussion. Uh, we have uh, good representation. There's three uh, members from the uh, uh, from our, our senior uh, council and uh, the executive director of the uh, senior center, and we've had uh, some really good discussion on it. So I think we're getting close. Uh, the committee goal was by this Thursday to have something that we were all in agreement on. We were close at the last meeting. We had two different. Uh, the scenarios that we were looking at based on the age of the, uh, the participants. Um, the problem that we've had is not so much drafting the law, though that takes time, was to do a spreadsheet or a, um, a financial model that makes sense, that works, that's likely to be what really does happen. Even though we can't predict how many seniors will actually take advantage of it, my prediction is about 25, by the way, it's a very small number. Uh, it's possible it could be larger. And if it was larger, what's the financial impl impl implications? The issue about credit and a deferral or credit or a deferral has been discussed by the committee. Right now, the committee is recommending to the Board of Selectmen, although they haven't voted, that it be or. You can either be part of the cr credit program or the deferral program. 
perhaps on Thursday they'll change their mind and come up with a different scenario. But right now that's where we are. Mr. Raymer. Uh, John, the first observation you made was that it's a, a new concept to you, that you had no experience with it. Um, but it seems to me then it would be very important for you to have an opportunity to take a very close look at other communities that have been running a program like this. So for example, from the standpoint of your estimation that 25 people will take advantage of it, I for one certainly would be very interested to see how that uh, guesstimate by you compares to what other communities have had an actual experience with sure. when they run a program. What other communities in our area have been running a deferral program? Westport was mentioned. Is Westport one of the towns that are yes. doing it? Yes. Are have. there other towns that are presently doing it? Yeah, there's 29 towns in the state of Connecticut that have a deferral program. Have now, we gathered data from those 29 towns? And not all of them, but many of them. Uh, we've looked at communities of a similar size. We've looked at a similar demographics. Um, I had experience with a deferral program in Darien, which is a little bit different than what we're doing here. We had seven participants in the whole town. Darien is about a third the size of Greenwich. Uh, New Canaan has one. Westport has one, of course. Norwalk has one. Weston has one. We've also looked at Fairfield, which is similar in population to, uh, to Greenwich. Uh, uh, West Hartford has one. There's a number of other communities that are similar to us. But there's less than a thousand uh, participants in the whole state amongst those 29 communities. When I said that we don't have experience, it wasn't so much that we don't know what the other communities are doing. Everybody has a little bit different uh, mixture of their program. What age they start at, what benefits they offer, whether it's and or or on the credit program, how rich it is, how uh, uh, what the dollar amount that uh, they're offering, a credit based on different incomes. Um, some of them are tax freezes. They just uh, lock uh, taxes so it can't go above where it is today. So it doesn't affect, it doesn't affect uh, the base, but future increases are affected. So you, it, it, it's not apples to apples when you're looking at each of these communities. What you're trying to do is come up with a program that can uh, blend in with the credit program so it would be something that would be beneficial. What we were looking at it is, as being something that's an option to our seniors. There are some seniors where a deferral would make more sense based on their financial situation. And so we've tried to figure out, well, uh, how should we stagger it based on our income, uh, the income limits that we have in the credit program. And so the, the committee, as I said, for the last six weeks have been debating all these different issues. Uh, we're very close to being in a position to say this is what we think should be presented to the, uh, to the board. How many of the 29 towns have you actually gathered data from? Did you, I, I didn't remember what that I'd say was. we looked at four or five uh, more in depth than we did the other 20, 20 some, but we have data on all of them. Um, I'm not sh really sure how valuable all of that is. The credit program was much, uh, that's much more universal throughout the state. There's a lot more good data. Our problem is trying to predict how many of our residents would be interested in the deferral program, what their income would be, and if we go the or route on the credit, you can either take a credit or the deferral, how many of the people within that grouping would select the credit, uh, the deferral versus the credit. Um, and it's, it's been quite a little exercise. Okay, we'll, we'll move on with this topic. We do have a BET representative on the committee Thursday. Mr. Gortney uh, will get out the information to us, although I, I suspect it'll, by the time it even reaches us, it'll be a little stale, but I think it'll give the members of the BET a flavor for what's occurring. Certainly, uh, my understanding is the meeting on Thursday uh, would be open to any BET sure. member who wished to attend. Um, and then, uh, as Mr. Simon indicated, this body will get a chance to review the ordinance that's ultimately passed, if it is, by the Board of Selectmen, sure. uh, and then be able to make any changes if necessary, and then pass it along to the RTM. So, um, we'll we're in the Everesto room, so if you feel you'd like to join us, feel free. Good. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Tarkington, on this topic or another? I just uh, want to ask a question about process, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Um, if, if the BET chose to make changes to this um, ordinance once it came to us, would it have to go back to the select, Selectman's Board thereafter, or it, would it go directly to the RTM? 
My understanding is last time it went directly to the RTM, but I could be wrong. But I don't believe we made that, any that changes. We, we did make the changes. We, we, I thought we made the change relative. We, we made some, some, some significant changes last time. Yeah, we did. And it went directly to the RTM. Right. Not to say that that was the right way to do it, but, if, but my understanding is we did ask that question at that time, and it was. So um, assuming that we, we did it correctly the first time, okay. we would go Thank back you. that way. Okay, I know at least um, Mr. Norton on this topic or on a different topic? Different topic. Okay, well then um, let me go back to Mr. Stone who had a question before we got onto this topic. Ted, um, on the revaluation number uh, item two, uh, what's, what do you feel is a drop dead date as to whether a decision, uh, when a decision will be made about uh, the reval? We should make a decision at the next meeting of the BET, which would be the October meeting. And as you, uh, as you're standing here this evening, which way do you think you'll be going? Do you think you'll have enough data? Um, <clears throat> I'd really rather make the recommendation at the next meeting. I, I can say that there, the sales have increased in terms of number and in terms of the market activity. Uh, the market trends are also declining still, but the commercial market is, has to date been holding on pretty well. Your, your section here uh, two, uh, I'll quote here, the uh, residential sales activity continues to be slow. So in view of that, you still think it's an open issue? At this point, yes. Thank you. That discussion will be a separate item in our uh, discussion for next month. Any anybody else on this topic? Let's try to stick with topics. That was a question or a variation of that same question. Okay. Would you still do you still have another question then for the town assessor? Well, it, it involves the revaluation, but it, <clears throat> what is the benefit to keep delaying the market analysis, Ted? You indicated in here, but delaying the market analysis and value setting phase. The, the market analysis is where we set the standards that will be applied for the revaluation. That's where we do our market modeling. Does that mean you don't have enough information to be able to do the market analysis? Is that what this means? Uh, what it means is that we, that we want to um, to have the information, see what information is available, and then make a decision to proceed with the market analysis. Ms. Tarkington. Uh, yes, Mr. Barton, you have a qu I have a um, question on um, the completion of the 2009 grand list. Yes. Um, which, you know, you will be doing, your department will be doing shortly. Yes. Um, you know, I, again, don't want to anticipate something too early, but do you have any feel yet for what's happening to the grand list? I mean, I understand it's using the values of October 1st, 2005. Yes. But do you have any feel yet for the changes on, you know, by category or anything else? Or is that premature? Um, I th I, if I understand your question, all values still trace back to the values of two th October 1st, 2005. Right. I was looking more for the new totals versus, you know, I, under I think I understand. You're thinking of new construction? New construction, uh, lot splits, consolidation. Yes. You know, overall, how does it look like it's going to compare year over year? Well, this last year we add added on to the 2008 ground list about 0.88 of 1%. We think that in this year, 2009, it will be a smaller percentage than this last year, perhaps 0.66, something in that range. Mm -hmm. We can't really say until we complete it, right. but we can say that it will probably be a smaller increase than it was last year. Thank you. Further questions for the town assessor? May I have a motion to accept the assessor's report? Second. Moved by Ms. Tarkington. Second. Second by Mr. Mason. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? 11 0, 0. Item 5 now comes before us. Mr. Gortney, thank you, and Mr. Shipman as well. 
Item five now comes before us, um, BET committees and special uh, project team reports. Uh, you should have received in your packet of information the OPEB trust board and the ad hoc OPEB committee reports, the audit committee reports, the Glenville School Building Committee, Nathaniel Witherell Town Building Committee, and Human Resources Committee report. Are there any questions um, on any of these reports? I have one for the um, Glenville School Building Committee report, Mr. Norton. Um, discussion uh, of, uh, I think at last month's meeting uh, or so, we discussed when potential move-in to that facility uh, would take place. And I know the building committee is separate from the Board of Ed and, and they ultimately make that decision. But uh, relative to TCO, could you give us a little bit of insight as to when the TCO is expected, at least at this stage? The TCO process has begun and it's the expectation of the committee that the TCO will probably not be granted until the photovoltaic system has been completed and the process for design, <coughs> construction, delivery, and installation of that, which will take approximately 11 weeks, began, I believe, last week. So if that schedule were to be followed, then the photovoltaic system would be installed by the end of November. And if the building department were to wait until the photovoltaic system had been installed on the building to complete the TCO process, then that would not be available until late in November, which would imply that the occupancy of the building for, for the uh, students would probably be January 1st. Is there any uh, possibility of obtaining, my understanding was that the TCO was not attached to the photovoltaic, that the photovoltaic was an add-on uh, when, when that appropriation came back to this board as a result of uh, monies that became available um, through, um, through state and federal agencies that, that that portion of the project was not going to delay occupancy. Well, it depends that upon, changed at all? Or? It depends upon when the photovoltaic system is installed. Yes, it is an add-on and could be done, but <clears throat> it's the opinion of, of the in a construction company that the, photo, uh, that the photovoltaic system, if it's being installed, will, will be done when school is not in session. And it makes sense to complete the project now with the installation of the photovol photovoltaic system before the building is completed. Thank you. Any other questions either for the Glenville School Building Committee or the other committees that I referenced? Moving on to item six of the agenda, the comptroller's report, our comptroller. Um, good evening, Mr. Chairman, BET members. I'd like to draw your attention to the first paragraph on the retirement board. Uh, in the last year or so, I've been putting in there a line noting when the fund reached its high point in October of 2007 of 361,000 and change. So um, what I've done is I've passed out a chart for everyone you have before you. I couldn't put in the low point because at one point uh, when they started there was very few dollars in there. So this is to act as an informational guide to trying to show you over the uh, last year and a half, uh, 14 months, how we, we rose and how we hit bottom in February and how we started to rise again. It's, it's for informational purposes only because I simply can't put in there the low point uh, of the fund. Having said that, you have a copy of the report. And I will answer any questions at this point. Before we take um, questions from uh, the members of the of the BET, could you discuss a little bit um, the timeline for Nathaniel Wither, at least as it relates to HDG, and um, if you could provide this body with an update as to what what occurred over the summer. Um, and why we sort of pushed back another month or so uh, with that process. Okay, uh, and I'm just going to repeat what's in the uh, controller's report. Chairman um, Walco appointed a um, special projects team of uh, Mr. Raymer, Mr. Simon, and uh, Leslie Tarkenton. And during the summer, uh, we engaged uh, Health Dimensions Group, known as HDG. 
And they got the business plan that was uh, prepared last February. And the project stalled around July or August because they couldn't move forward because they didn't have uh, current construction cost. And secondly, what happened was the, the state of Connecticut had uh, a budget crisis and they were anticipating changes in Medicare and Medicaid reimbursements. Based on that, officials at Nathaniel Witherall revised the business plan again, which put the whole project completely um, at a stalling point. So what has happened is um, they've updated the business, they meaning Nathaniel Witherall, the business plan, which is maybe markedly different than the one that HDG has. So they're waiting for that business plan update and the construction costs within the next week or two so that they could resume the project. Uh, when the project is, is re, uh, resumed, they will go back and try to uh, interview all of the Nathaniel Witherall people responsible, uh, that they feel responsible for input. Example would be Ray Augustine, Lynn Bausch, members of the building committee, uh, members of the BET, in particular the four individuals on the special projects team. Uh, now, the information that I list on the second page there was based on a building committee meeting on September 11th with a presentation from Turner Construction. So it's the guidelines of Cur Turner Construction to the building committee. And hopefully they'll get construction cost estimates on October 7th to the board from the building committee. And then we can resume with the project. And if the project resumes, hopefully the time frame would be that HDG comes up with a draft report, supplies it to the BET, and over the winter, whether it's December or January, there can be a, a review, a presentation, and acceptance of the report. And then the rest of it outlines the, uh, the schedule as far as building permitting and the construction timeline. And their goal is to get a approval from the BET in May based on your acceptance of the report and firm construction numbers. And then it'll go to the RTM in June, and hopefully they can start construction in the month of June for 132 week uh, period. Questions, Ms. Tarkington? Uh, yes, I think um, while this um, timeline is in here as a guideline, I think that, you know, again, um, you know, it's been reported to the board in, my, in this month's report um, that while the town building committee, Witherall Town Building Committee, um, has issued an award letter to turn in construction, there is no contract or agreement with Turner Construction yet. So, um, you know, again, this was an initial presentation and the most senior person wasn't there. I think all of us remembered that back in March of 07, we also had a timeline from Turner Construction that was very different. Also, um, this timeline doesn't take into consideration such things as the awarding or whatever it is of the CON and other things that will have to happen in the interim on this project in order to, again, confirm <coughs> receipt of the, of the revenue stream that will be, uh, go into obviously the long range business plan. So there are some issues here and likewise, um, there's another issue about the um, moving forward, I assume, with design development documents by the architect because it's sort of a chicken and egg while the business plan hasn't yet been approved the architect would like to proceed and to date the town building committee has not as a as a committee has not yet met with the architect so there's there's some things that probably need to be discussed on this but it is a something that was presented to the building committee at the last meeting first on st staying with Nathaniel Withers are there any other comments or questions mr. stone yep. um, I I had the impression that um, no important money was going to be expended until the HDG report was received. Uh, and now we're understanding uh, some, uh, some delays in that process. But at the same time, uh, according to the report that we have here tonight from our liaison to the Witherall Building Committee, uh, I'd say relatively important money has been spent 
uh, it's a little confusing as to exactly how much, but certainly in the area of 350 or 400,000, maybe much higher than that. Uh, how does that wash with the understanding that we'd, we had reached uh, that there was going to be this, at least a, uh, a marking of time until HTG had come back to us? Okay. Want me to answer first? First of all, there's an appropriation in place for 7.3 million. Oh, I understand. Just, so there is there is money in place for architectural pre-construction pre-construction cost to be spent. And I don't think any of that is is, is held uh, tied into the report. Well, I know that we've appropriated the funds, but I also am fairly certain that we had an understanding. At least I had a belief that that little of those funds were going to be actually committed until HDG's report was received and vetted by us. So you're you're saying that the seven million three you feel could be expensed prior to HDG's report coming in? We need to hire the architect and pay for the architect. But the Retention, the engagement of the architect, well, again, maybe I'll, I'll address this to, uh, to Leslie. Uh, all of this was dependent on, uh, on our feeling comfortable that the business plan, um, which was going to basically uh, draw a line around the design, the business plan was acceptable. And that was going to be um, uh, dependent on HDG's analysis of that business plan. So am I simply under a misapprehension about our having the intention to wait until HDG's report was in? Let me take a crack at it, and then I'll, I'll let Ms. Tarkington. So I think it's a, it's, I don't think there's a bright line in the sand. I think it's a level of degree. And, and, and I agree with you that I believe it was last December uh, when um, Nathaniel Wither Board came before this body and addressed this issue. Um, in, in my discussions with Nathaniel Wither or, or various members of their board, including their chairman, I think they would uh, argue that, in fact, the monies that they are spending, um, that they're not spending them uh, arbitrarily or frivolously that that's money that needs to be spent in order to be able to get HDG and this body the amount of information that's needed for us to make informed decisions. Um, we, we, the reason why we brought them forward is to have that discussion back in December. Obviously we have no real authority to tell them not to spend the money that we previously appropriated, but it was so that there was a shared or common understanding relative to not spending all of the 7.3 if it was not needed, especially in light of the fact that if that business plan came forward and was not approved by and, and fully vetted by HDG and this body, that that would cause uh, we shouldn't unnecessarily spend taxpayer money on a plan that, that couldn't get off the ground. So I don't want to speak for Nathaniel whether I haven't spoken to them recently or that board, but, but I guess if they were standing or sitting here today that they would say that this is money that they need to spend in furtherance of getting us the information that's necessary for us to make a decision. Whether or not we agree with that or not, I think we can ask the question, and I would ask that um, a sensible way to follow this through is just to simply ask them maybe to come next month to give us an update as to where they are, what they've spent. We'll have some more information from HDG at that time, and we can ask them those questions. I think that would be an excellent idea, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, the, the impression I had from that last meeting with David Ormsby was here, as well as other members of his board, was that little if, little if, uh, if any money was going to be spent um, uh, that, uh, that would go in a particular direction that, from which they might have to reverse uh, based on maybe a decision, an ultimate decision that the business plan had to be altered significantly. And, and therefore, that the, that the design work that was going to be done was going to be minimal. It was going to be pre-design work, in effect. Is that correct? I, I wouldn't disagree with what you're saying. Once again, though, I think it's a matter of degree. And, and, I, and because they're not here to talk to us about that, I think it's, it's a better discussion for next month. Certainly, 
um, I will uh, tomorrow convey those sentiments to the chairman of the Nathaniel Witherell Board and ask that they appear at our October meeting. Like I said, I think that will be a, a, a good meeting anyway because, in fact, we will have presumably gone through the interviews through with HDG and, and at least gotten their preliminary um, uh, feel for where this project is headed. Okay. And, and then just to follow up, Mr. Chairman, is it uh, correct to assume that HDG will appear before this board to basically make a presentation as they did I'd say four or five years back under a prior engagement where they were reviewing a, a similar, a somewhat similar business plan presented by the Kavunas, the then Kavunas board? I, I wasn't here then, but that's better posed to the chairman. Uh, I, we, we retained HDG, obviously, right. in the hopes that they do verify the numbers that Nathaniel Witherell has presented, or if not, by then, uh, made some suggestions to, to get it on track, assuming that it's off track, which I'm, which I'm not uh, stating that it is, but to try to work with Nathaniel Witherell so that when the final product does uh, uh, move forward to this body for approval of construction money and the RTM, that we have an additional layer other than this, the skills of this body to have reviewed it professionally to say we have a high degree of certainty that the business plan as laid out is a good one and that there's a, a sound backing to that plan. So yes, that uh, based on at least the schedule that's the preliminary schedule, that seems to be suggested that it would come before us in the November to January time frame. And they'll be here physically to present Physically that. to present okay. that. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Tarkin. Yeah, I think that um, Mr. Uh, Stone's uh, recollection is um, you know, pretty pretty clear, and um, you know there have been numerous discussions, and we've continued to you know have documented every month since then what's been going on, you know, with the building committee at Nathaniel Witherall. But I think as as our chairman has pointed out, there's been kind of a chicken and the egg here because the RFP for what's now turned out to be HDS, but could have been some other firm, was really written. And, you know, I think that our controller thought and our chairman that this board would want something similar to what the board at that point in time, and I wasn't on this board, saw. And, and the analysis from um, HDS included the business plan together with the design for the building and the construction costs for that building in order to get to the point of having construction costs Obviously, there do have to be architectural renderings, and they really have to relate to the programming, so the operations of Nathaniel Witherall. So this has been, um, you know, kind of a uh, balancing act here. And you know, when we and the RTM approved the $7.3 million by resolution, we really didn't put any conditions on the use of it, which is something we should think about if this ever comes up again. But um, I think, you know, having um, them come back next month um, makes sense. And that's why at the end of my report this month, I did make a comment that really now, while SLAM would like to continue with design development documents, um, it, it would seem to me that prior to input from HDS, and maybe it's just the meetings that we have when, when they occur, um, that um, perhaps there shouldn't be additional detailed design drawings done. Um, but again, I, I, people are anxious to move this project along, and there really are no real constraints on how the money was well, no conditions. Mr. Kremick. I think we're making this a little bit more than, than it actually was. Um, we decided to uh, engage a consultant so that we would have information about the, uh, the business plan, the finances, the feasibility of the project, so we would be ready when they came back with the next phase um, to um, uh, to approve or not approve that that funding, that was the initial the initial uh, concept, and that's why we 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 uh, appropriated the money. With respect to um, our discussions with Nathaniel Witherell and the Budget Committee and other places, we always we have an understanding with them that they are not going to go full bore ahead with with everything they could be doing 
if they were going to push the process the way it would be done, but that the money would be available and would be used as needed to do uh, the, the study that they need to go forward, not just to satisfy uh, us or to satisfy the consultants, but also uh, to uh, do the groundwork they need to move the project along. This was not intended, and it shouldn't be used as, uh, as a sea anchor to, to slow the project down. Uh, and I, I think that sometimes people make more of it than, uh, than it actually was at the time. Unless there are other, Mr. Turner, on, on this question, on this issue? Different issue. Okay. Uh, very well. Comptroller's report, Mr. Norton. Yes, um, Peter, under cash management and vendor payments, and the ACH and the electronic trans, electronic fund transfers, um, how long do you anticipate that uh, will be before Munis is able to uh, populate the addendum? I'll ask my Munis expert. Okay, so you think that uh, we... The, the issue is not the problem sending out the H... H uh, it's recording it. ...to the banking system. It is the email notification that goes with that to the vendors so that when they see the money hit the bank account, they know what's being paid. And that's that's the hold up. It's this, this uh, <coughs> creation of the, of the email document. Is that a programming issue? So why can't we resolve the programming issue? Mr. Simon. Um, this really is a combination of your report and the Treasurer's report. Um, where, how are we investing our money now? I noticed that you wrote that we're getting better money, better rates from our money market funds at the bank as opposed to the stiff fund from the state of Connecticut. And yet when I look on the Treasurer's <coughs> report, I think we're getting, I'm not quite sure I see all these rates. Okay, what, to answer the question, you go to page five, and you see the inset chart. You see the money market line? Mm -hmm. That's where it's all being invested in the general fund. And one of the restrictions was uh, there was $5 million minimums. So the banks, uh, uh, <coughs> actually Roland's helping us with this, we're going to commingle some of the odd funds, which are the funds below the general fund, excluding the OPEB fund. And we're going to invest some of that money into the money market commingled with the general fund and track it separately. So to simply answer your question, the four, the four uh, TD, Bank of America, JPM, Chase, and Webster is where we're putting the money now. And as you recall, uh, the investment committee um, it does not allow us to uh, go back to STIF and further down. Kathleen's in the process of doing a credit review of STIF, and what's holding that up is we don't have June 30th numbers from the state of Connecticut on the STIF performance. So it's in the it's in the uh, the bank money markets. So the bank money market offers us more flexibility than a CD. Is that yes. Correct? Yes. Five million dollars is clearly not a problem for us. So we should be getting. Instead of the, the terrible rates we were getting before, we should be getting the rates where it says money market? Yes. With, with, uh, it's, there's a combination because some of the money was invested at different times. For example, there's a reference there where the TD Bank, some of that money was getting 0.95%. Uh, it's been dropped to 0 0.75, so you simply can't go from the Treasurer's report and go to this chart because the money was invested at uh, different times. I just, I just want to make sure that when I read this correctly, on the Treasurer's report it says we're getting like nine-tenths of one percent, like one-eighth of what it says on the controller's report. Uh, where are you at, Larry? I'm on the fifth line where it says TD North percent, 0 0.91 percent. Okay, that's that's probably a digit uh, off. It should be 0 0.91. That should be 91 basis points. And the one above it? Which it is. It is. It is. It is. It is. It is. 
No, it's nine basis. No, MBIA is not even on the chart. No, nine basis points would have another zero. It's 91 basis points, all right? We're getting nine tenths of one, nine that's, that's 91 basis points. Okay, thank you. Mr. Stone. Peter, how, uh, uh, how is the uh, treasurer uh, uh, assessing the, uh, the stiff fund uh, from the standpoint of analysis? Is she using an agency or doing it internally? She's actually uh, the structured uh, the CIVs, investment uh, vehicles that were, uh, I think Cheney was one of the investments. Uh, she was one of the first people in the state of Connecticut from a municipality to find out that they were not, uh, they were on shaky ground. And she brought that to the attention of the investment committee a couple of years ago. And that's when we had the action of pulling out the money from STIF before the other towns had even picked up on it. So to answer your question, the treasurer has the expertise to do it by herself. And what she's going to get is they have a monthly report. It's a little booklet, and she's waiting for the 630, right. and it gives all the investments. She's going to analyze what's in the portfolio. And if she determines that there isn't any of the structured investment vehicles in there, or if there's any investments that are uh, of uh, unacceptable quality, she will put that in her report, and, and she won't come forward with a recommendation to go back to STIF. So to answer your question, the treasurer is doing it because she feels competent enough to do it. She clearly has done some excellent work in the past. Yep. Uh, uh, at the same time, it's uh, to a degree, it's uh, it's certainly time consuming. I'm I'm just wondering, is there not some resource that we should be making available to her to do the type of analysis that that I'm sure, I, at least I feel certain, must be being done in the marketplace? Other towns don't have a treasurer with this, uh, with, with Kathleen's expertise. They, they use a, a Fitches or someone like that to, to track uh, an important fund like the Stiff Fund. Uh, are we making these kinds of resources available? Uh, well, good point. The, the, uh, the answer is no, because of the uh, confidence of the treasurer. Other towns that don't have the same uh, expertise they do pay for that service, and actually MBIA, and there are, there are firms out there that provide that service, but you pay for it. So you, so, and I can discuss this with the treasurer. We can go out and find out who's out there who would provide that service, but it's got to be, there's going to be a cost uh, attributed to it. I'm sure there's a cost. Uh, at the same time, it's, uh, again, uh, uh, her time is valuable, and, and, and that cost is uh, just an observation. It's, uh, it's absorbed very quickly by any sort of a, you know, of a loss that could be experienced. She might not be as on top of a situation as a, you say, uh, uh, Fitches or, or one of the other agencies that's, whose business is to do just that. You might just want to review it with her. No, excellent suggestion. We'll look into it. Thank you. Other questions for our comptroller? Is there a motion to approve the report? So moved. Moved by Mr. Norton. Second. Second by Mr. Raymer. Finger? Finger. Mr. Finger? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. 11 0 0. Is there a motion to accept the treasurer's report? Moved by Mr. Norton. Second. Second by Mr. Simon. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention? 11 0 0. Item 8 now comes before us approval of the BET meeting minutes for July 20th, 2009. Is there a motion for approval? So moved by Mr. Mason. Second. Second by Mr. Simon. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstention? 11-0-0. Item now comes before us. Officer's report. Mr. Stone? No, thank you. Ms. Tarkington? No, nothing. A few items to report. Um, first of all, you should have received your invitation to celebrating DSS's century of service, providing hope for those in need. Um, that is October 16th, 2009 at uh, 8 a.m. If you did not receive your invitation in the mail, let me know. 
and I will ensure that one gets transmitted to you. I don't know what it says about our town that the BET and DSS were formed in the same year, but uh, we, sh <laughs> we share a birthday. Um, you should have also received from the uh, Registrar of Voters uh, the, the review of the voting machines, the inspection and testing and sealing of the tabulators used for the election, um, and um, you should respond if you wish to attend. Um, I will. Uh, I have some other comments, but before I do, I'm going to uh, turn it over for a brief moment to our celebration chairman, um, Mr. Simon, to discuss the BET's 100th year anniversary celebration. Thank you. Thank you very much. The BET will be holding its biennial dinner for all members of the BET who have served on it for the last 100 years, and it will be on Wednesday night, December 9th, starting at 6 o'clock. Everybody will be getting a mem will be getting an invitation. Um, we will be trying to search and obtain addresses and email addresses for all members of the BET. It should be quite a nice evening, and that information will be coming shortly, but please mark your calendars for Wednesday, December 9th. Thank you. It will be at Burning Tree Country Club. The, the last comments that I have um, really revolve around the budget guidelines uh, and uh, the process that's in place in my several discussions with various members of the public, um, not only this year but last year in terms of process, as well as uh, the discussion of the um, uh, workers' compensation presentation to the Budget Committee uh, this past week. Um, obviously still trying to get a feel for what are appropriate presentations to the Budget Committee as opposed to this body. Um, it was observed that it was, it was probably served the public um, if, in fact, that presentation, I'm speaking of the workers' comp presentation, was before this full body because a lot of the members had questions um, and it was a better uh, environment or presentation to have at this meeting. So I can say that, that that continues to be a work in progress, but to those presentations that would better suit this body as opposed to just the budget committee, we'll try to get more of the presentations here for us to all deliberate. Uh, but we, I would like to say that the addition of GCTV to the cone room, which we hope that the budget committee will be back in uh, next month, will also add an element of um, uh, public participation through GCTV and that those discussions can now be televised, which I think is an important step in the right direction. Um, but also over the past week or so, and, and I would say quite frankly even throughout um, August, various members of the public most notably those either on the Board of Ed or RTM or various other boards and commissions in town, um, have called to discuss generally guidelines, and, and a lot of times the guidelines weren't even out at that point. Um, and I think that remains to be a process that's a work in, in progress. Uh, and that's also to the extent that some of this um, information um, is either stale or inaccurate, and that's why this body meets and discusses it. And so. Um, I know several groups have asked, you know, to, to republish the guidelines and to then discuss them, um, and, and I've talked to those various groups about it potentially being premature because the guidelines, in fact, aren't ratified by this body until October now under the, the new system that was instituted last year. So um, to that extent, I welcome any user groups, whether that be the RTM Board of Ed, um, and I know uh, Louisa Stone is here tonight and I've spoken to her about the guidelines, um, and it's not so much that when we first begin to talk about them, those people who do attend our meetings understand that they're drafts and that we're working on them. But I think it's the second and third generation um, copying of the guidelines, at least at this stage, that could cause some uh, consternation and some undue um, conversations that are just not as productive as they would be at a later date. Uh, so we're working on it, uh, hopefully refine it as, as the process moves along not only this year but in, in subsequent years to try to get a, a, a better system in place to get out accurate information that's also um, up compliant with FOI rules and so there's always a little bit of a rub there. Um, so, so I as chairman am working on that and trying to figure out if there's a better way to, to run government. Um, so we will continue to, to try to get better. But I do appreciate all the comments, and I've suggested uh, that any comments relative to the guidelines, which Mr. Mason will discuss in a few minutes, uh, be sent either through him or to the Finance Department. But we'll get into the um, meat and potatoes of that discussion in a few minutes. 
Moving on to item 10, old business. Uh, we don't have any this month. Um, to item 11, new business. Now we have four items to present tonight. Um, let me just give an overview of the law department uh, for that. And we have the town attorney here and, and Frank Mazza. For that, we will be going into executive session to talk uh, predominantly about two matters. Uh, we have the approval of the BET meeting schedule. Uh, there's a, um, there'll be a brief discussion on the guideline schedule and upcoming events, and then a presentation by um, the Eastern Greenwich Civic Center and Irv Porter is here for that. Um, if the law department and Mr. Mazza will indulge us, if it's all right with them, I would like to see if we can uh, dispense with the BET meeting schedule and the guideline schedule discussion first. And then, um, okay for Mr. Porter to stick around, um, and then um, go into executive session and finish with the Eastern Granite Civic Center discussion. And I only say that because there might be questions on the Eastern Granite Civic Center, and I wouldn't want to rush that discussion simply because we were going into executive session. Um, so if that's okay with Mr. Fox, um, why don't we first talk about the BET meeting schedule. It was attached as an addendum to the budget guidelines. Um, obviously, there's always a little bit of a conflict with some of the other boards and commissions in town. We try to um, obviously stand clear of RTM meetings. And so is there a motion to approve that schedule? Moved by Mr. Simon. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Mason. Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstention. 11-0-0. Thank you. Uh, now for the 10-11 guideline schedule, I turn it over to Mr. Mason, our budget chair. <clears throat> As we did last year, the, the process so far in the guidelines has been to get uh, obviously get a draft. There was a obviously some moving targets this year with uh, numbers on revenue and conveyance numbers, and we're waiting for the last bit of school uh, enrollment numbers. And that is out. And what's happened right now, and what I would ask all of our members, and I know they've gotten this in communication, Friday is our, our deadline that we are asking for any comments or suggestion to go to, they can come to myself or it can go to Roland in Finance. Uh, Friday will be a, will collate that and send that to all the members so they can at least see the subject matters. We have received already responses from several of our members and I'm anticipating some more. And then Tuesday afternoon, we do have a workshop scheduled, for, which is something we started last year for the first time, um, which the Budget Committee will sit down and, and go over that. And hopefully from there, uh, have an agreed draft to send to this body for approval at our next regular meeting. Uh, so again, if you have comments or suggestions, draft language is really appreciated, uh, get that to roll in. Um, Roland, I think I've, if I, if I may, I think I've sent you at least a half a dozen or so, so far. Um, so with that, that will be our process for this year. And then from there, we'll, I would say we'll call it, once we get through that work session, we'll hopefully formulate a draft too, and then work from there. So first, let me take Mr. Norton and then Mr. Minarski, our comptroller. My question has to do with the workshop, where and when? Oh, the, I, it's 4 o'clock Tuesday? It's next Tuesday, 4 o'clock in the Parks and Rec uh, conference room upstairs. Didn't it, I think that went out today, that notice. It, the email went to you to approve. Oh, okay. So I told uh, Elaine we were discussing it tonight. It will be posted tomorrow. But it's next Tuesday, 4 o'clock in the Parks and Rec uh, conference room upstairs, the only room we can get. I, I appreciate your comments. Mr. Mason swore to me that it went out and I thought I was going crazy. So <laughs> I still might be, but, but at least I'm not crazy about this issue. Um, Mr. Minarski, did you have any other comment other than oh, when no, it was? I have questions to the process for Mike. Last year, if we had three meetings. The first one was a work session. Then the second two were uh, special meetings requiring minutes. Right. Is the first one going to be a work session where you don't require a minutes and transcribe my minutes I would think that we should 
we, we're not going to take any official action, obviously. Okay, um, so there's actually not a need for minutes, but I think we'll, we'll need to keep track of minutes because we're going to have material there. And my plan would be, depending on how we do in our first work session, it would be thinking about a special meeting after that before the regular budget committee meeting. Okay, so, so to, to Art's question, if tomorrow <laughs> when we, we post this, you don't want to post it as a special work session. You want to post it as a special meeting. Okay. To be honest, I've never quite understood the difference between a work session and a meeting. I have had this discussion with the Board of Ed. They might have a better understanding of it. I, 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 certainly, I certainly don't, other than the fact that no, no votes are taken. But, um, but, and this is especially if any of the, the Budget Overview Committee members are, are watching at home. Uh, that again, and for RTM members who, who wish to attend this because it is a public meeting, that's Tuesday, 4 o'clock, uh, September 29th in the Parks and Rec uh, meeting room. I would. The room is small. It, the table holds eight. So it, if you get over 20, 25 people, you're going to have people in the hallway. So bring your chairs. <laughs> or we'll televise. Understood. Um, if, if the finance department can make sure that that notice gets specifically sent to the chairman of the BOC and the finance department of um, finance committee of the RTM, I think that would be helpful again in making sure that they are aware of what we're doing early on in the stage as they have requested and I think is important for the process. Okay, further comments or questions? Okay. So other than the Eastern Greenwich Civic Center presentation, uh, that leaves us with the Law Department's uh, presentation on a couple of uh, current litigation matters to which I will entertain a motion to go into executive session. So moved. Moved by Mr. Crummick. Second. Second by Mr. Mason. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 11 0, 0 at 743. Our last item uh, of the evening is a presentation on the status of the Eastern Greenwich Civic Center. Uh, you should have all received a brief memo from um, Karen Sadakan and Irv Porter, uh, Chairman and Vice Chairman, respectively, of the Greenwich Civic Center Committee. Um, this tonight, um, notwithstanding that memo, I know that requests BET's endorsement of the plan of action is merely a presentation to give us an update as to where you are, field any questions from this body, um, and to let us be aware of what it is of your intent and what your plan of action is going forward. Um, and so with that, Mr. Porter, thank you for waiting. Thank you. Thank you all for your service. I was thinking as I listened to you that uh, four or five qualities that promote personal and professional growth, I always learned are honesty, integrity, the willing to draw the line in the sand and stand on principle, um, empathy, and last but not least, perseverance. Those are pretty good criteria from any parent's point of view or anybody, any manager's point of view. And I don't know how many people really appreciate the kind of perseverance that this body has to have in order to continue to be the good stewards that you are of of the town. I mean that. So I'm, I'm proud to be here tonight. I usually am the wingman, uh, but uh, the plane that's flying around is ill. Karen cannot be here, so I appreciate especially that you would indulge me. Have you all had an opportunity to read the memo that Okay, good. Uh, I'm not going to be redundant with that. I want to highlight just two or three things. And then if you want to make note uh, in the column of your, of your memo, I'll bring to life each one of those five points with some illustrations, not with the expectation that I can diffuse any questions, but rather to give you the benefit of the discussion that we had first with the stakeholders of the town. Larry was there uh, and participated in that. Mike and Steve were both invited to come but could not and were briefed. Um, and all three selectmen were there. And then on the 24th after that stakeholder meeting, 
uh, we met with Mr. Tessie, and basically we politely said we need help. And the reason that we need help, even though we uh, established a 501c3 with the express purpose of being able to unburden uh, the town on any of the expenses related to this project. And everything that we have done thus far, we've paid for out of donations from private citizens. But when we decided that we were going to go forward with a new needs assessment, a new survey of what the needs were of the town, which was precipitated really by the fact that in 2006 we had a different world in Greenwich than we have today, and, and the world was different in several contexts. I don't mean uh, the financial services world. That was different as well. But since 2006, You've got the Y M on stream, and you know all of the financial problems that they're struggling with. You've done the Y W over six million dollar investment. The Boys and Girls Club is up and running, eighteen million dollars. Um, when you add all of those numbers up, the redundancy uh, manifests itself if you monetize what those investments were from people that have contributed out of their, their own pockets, it's 65 to $70 million, including that Western Greenwich Civic Center, and include uh, the adult daycare center now at, uh, at the old power station in Coscob, which was basically privately funded. You add all those up, and people have been very, very philanthropic and been willing to go forward. Now, along the way somewheres, as you all are well aware, the Center for Arts, for the Arts, popped up its idea, and uh, that was uh, postponed, maybe is a polite way to put it, uh, but they had no alternative in that case uh, to, to say, hey, time out, we're not going forward. And we listened and learned from every one of those with a conscious notion that we were all going to be below the radar screen and do this on a project basis and a very, very business-like basis. Whatever it was that we were going to go forward with would have a business plan to support it. We would have defined the needs in the community. We would have vetted the whole process completely. And we were lucky that we didn't do that. Um, an illustration that we gave to uh, the Board of Selectmen that I think bears repeating is we went to the management of Greenwich Hospital. If you stop and think about a, a fitness recreation facility, a place where you've got meeting facilities, where social needs that are not met uh, except through a new facility, and you kind of put one word around that, you come up with the word wellness. And there is nobody in town that is in the wellness business that knows the business any better than Greenwich Hospital. So we met the management of Greenwich Hospital, June-ish, late May, June. And uh, we described to them what we were doing, and they politely said to us, Thank God you didn't come here 18 months ago, because if you had, we would have said, what can we do to help, and look where we would be today. So we've been lucky as we've gone along, and maybe prudent and erred, if anything, on the conservative side, in order to make sure that if we do something where we're going to the private citizenry in order to ask them to help funding, uh, that the bottom line is that we got to get it right. Um, at the meeting after the stakeholders meeting, we said, you know, what ideas do we have? Because by that time, we had gone to 70, 70 philanthropic folks who have always been supportive of worthwhile projects in the community. And I want you to guess with me how many of those folks said, we're willing to help you finance the pre-design phase. The answer is somewhere between zero and two. And the reason that they gave us very clearly was that there was no process established 
where if they were asked to contribute, even though it would be a deductible item, because if it came through the Greenwich Civic Center Committee, a 501c3 organization, and I'm not an expert on tax law, but uh, it would appear to be a deductible item. But they weren't really sure whether or not there was going to be uh, a substantive facility there that would justify then making the contribution that they did. And they pointed very clearly to what happened uh, for the Center of the Arts. That really uh, hammered us. And it, it hammered us in the context that if we were not able to convince people that had always shown dramatically their interest in, in being able to uh, uh, help finance a facility of this type, then we were in trouble. And so out of the discussion came the idea of making a presentation of these same five, po five points to the Board of Selectmen. And then after the Board of Selectmen endorsed it, we were very careful with the word endorsement. We didn't want to use the word support. We didn't want to use the word approved. We wanted the word endorsement. We wanted to depoliticize the whole implication to make absolutely sure that this was not a political issue, but rather it was something that had to stand the test of time. That uh, we needed next to come to you and ask you for the same endorsement. Once we had those endorsements, then the next step would be to go to planning and zoning. We're in the plan of conservation and development. There are specific references to the Eastern Greenwich Civic Center and the Greenwich Civic Center Committee. And basically what the plan of conservation and development says is that the plan recommends that the private initiative that has been started uh, be supported. There's the words are... Those aren't word for word what it is, but basically it says, hey, let's be supportive. There's a group out there that knows what they're doing. Let's go forward. Um, so uh, that's why uh, I'm here or we're here tonight to ask for your endorsement, not approval, endorsement. We recognize that we would have to come back to this body, and we ask that you formally, uh, when you review the five-point plan, that you take a vote and tell us whether you endorse our proposal or our plan or not. Now, the five specific steps. And I'm oh, Mr. Kremick? Uh, just a point of order. Uh, now that uh, Mr. Porter has asked for our endorsement, which is exactly what uh, Ms. Sadiq uh, Khan uh, asked for in a September 22nd memo, uh, I just wanted to raise the point of order because uh, I, I don't believe that that is an appropriate request. The BDT does not endorse projects or plans uh, this, in, following this, this process. We don't do, uh, generally we don't do even sense of the meeting resolutions, the bane of the RTM. Uh, so I'm just, I, I'm wondering, uh, certainly being, uh, certainly being uh, briefed about uh, um, the activities of this uh, of this committee and a very important project, that's that's appropriate. But asking for our endorsement, I think, is uh, is um, is out of order. I, don't, I, st I think it's important that Mr. Um, Porter finish his comments relative to giving the presentation, and at the appropriate time, uh, this body will decide whether or not it will take any action uh, relative to the request of Mr. Porter. Point, point well taken, and, and we will address it. But I think for the purposes of this discussion, it's still an important discussion to have and allow Mr. Porter to finish his presentation. Um, and to support that, Mr. Crummick, uh, I understand that this is a unique request. Uh, we, When we queried uh, planning and zoning, they made it very, very, very clear that if we came to them for endorsement, using that word, that uh, that was not something they could do. So from a procedural point of view, from a protocol point of view, from a policy point of view, from a charter point of view, if endorsement is the wrong word, then we stand corrected. But we still wanted to provide you with the information that you need to have uh, because basically what we're doing 
is saying to the town of Greenwich that well, we'll be saying to the town of Greenwich that we've been to the Board of Selectmen, we've been to the BET, we've been to planning and zoning, and getting back to the five qualities that promote personal and professional growth, there's no way that I would be a part of a project where we were not completely honest and, and, and have absolutely the forthright integrity to make sure that we knew procedurally what it was that we could and could not say. So if we can't say that, then you need to advise us that we can't say that, and we'll accept that, okay? So the five steps just to go on. Uh, number one, uh, the update of the assessment was done. I mentioned that uh, there are a number of facilities that are now online. The advice and counsel that we've had always on this from the professionals, and we've hired, we hired a professional, have a, a on retainer a professional who's as good as there is nationwide, went through an RFP process in order to find the best. And right from the get-go, he said, you've got to be very, very careful with redundancy. Redundancy not only on nonprofit facilities that may offer the same services that you do, but redundancy with for-profit facilities. Because he could cite rhyme and verse, town after town, where the private sector would compete with the public sector, and their strategy would be specifically to bury a project that was going to be, quote, nonprofit and would not be driven by, let's call it, market conditions. Um, an example of change that's occurred on the private side is Fitness Edge was not up and running to the extent in 2006 that it is today. LA Fitness was not looking for a site in Greenwich, didn't have a site in Stanford. Uh, the New York Sports Club was not up and running to the extent that it is today. This is a very competitive business. And therefore, whatever it is that we offer not only has to be affordable for the people that use it, but also has to be competitive in terms of the services that it offers. So that's the, that's, that's the point that I wanted to make on number one. On number two, uh, we selected through an RFP process, somebody that we think uh, was head and shoulders above the other alternatives, and when we chose Roger Ferris Partners. For about a year, uh, we had difficulty reaching conceptual agreement that we could implement an agreement with them just for the pre-design phase on a pay-as-you-go basis. Because we couldn't put ourselves in a position where we were going to commit to X million dollar project. We had to limit ourselves to the pre-design. But through that whole process, we know who the architects are that have the qualifications that are necessary in order to put a competitive facility in this community. We'll actively solicit town-wide, broad-based private financial support. And the implicit question that you should ask is, how much do you think it's going to cost for the pre-design phase? And the answer to that is $250,000, including the reassessment. Upon completion of the pre-design phase, hold a series of public forums in which we can vet a number of alternatives. We heard loud and clear when we met with the stakeholders and we've heard loud and clear from the Board of Selectmen that we need to be sensitive to the people that are using the facility today. We need to be sensitive to the notion in today's environment that smaller is better without compromising flexibility because the experts will tell you that what we're doing today in the wellness or fitness or recreation area is totally different than what was expected 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And if you're thinking about a facility that's going to have a, a life of 50 years, and I picked that just nominally, I don't mean that that's the design, you have to have a facility that's flexible enough in order to adapt to the changing needs of the culture of the community. Uh, so can't really run the risk of compromising flexibility. Uh, depending upon the public response, 
<coughs> we would proceed to work with the town, meaning we could come back to, we would be back to all of, of, of the bodies that have an impact in the decision making and incorporate what we've learned out of all of that and do it in such a way that, <coughs> excuse me, energy efficiency of a building, the notion of fuel cells, which has been talked about, and certainly a, a, a critical piece is you know if you've lived here that that facility was built on a bog. So drainage is a key issue. We're at the point now where on drainage, as you know, I think, I hope DPW has reported this, that we've spent $2 million and we know what the limitations are on takeaway capacity, including the limits, limitations on takeaway capacity in that area. <coughs> Excuse me. And then last but not least, uh, after whatever it is your decision and whatever it is you may or may not say, depending upon what the proper policy protocol is, uh, will go to POCD. To, to the reference to POCD with planning and zoning. Uh, we'll give them an updated assessment and you can take for granted that no matter what the outcome is, if this private body moves forward, that when we get to the point with a completed assessment, with the completion of the pre-design phase, with the vetting of what the alternatives are, that before we can go forward, we have to have a solid, solid business plan. Uh, th that's my update. I'll be happy to take any questions. Mr. Mason. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Porter. Um, wow. I have a, a few things. Um, first thing is, obviously, I, I do agree with Mr. Cromick that, you know, that we, I don't think this group normally does that, and I think that this is the time to get some questions and, and concerns on the table. I, I guess what I'm understanding is you're trying to <coughs> Fraser, and I'm not sure of the governance of the project whether it would be an external entity doing the gift on behalf of the town. For for instance, Western Greenwich Civic Center was a was a town appropriation, was a town project. It just happened to have a subsidy of a of a grant from was an MI a, a foundation. And I do remember you at the at the budget uh, work meetings that we had and we, we talked about the roof on the building and there was an issue there and Mr. Minnelli brought a sample of the roof in and we, we talked at that time about committing to a, a roof when mm -hmm. we didn't have an overall plan. So I, I think as you move forward we need to understand our, are you trying to raise the cash and then specific authorize the, the project or because if you go from there, then we have to start talking about governance and who's, you know, are you looking to change the governance of the facility? Are we, are we switching it out of Parks and Rec? I think these are a lot of questions that will be, will be coming along. You, you weren't at the meeting that Mr. Simon was at, and all those questions were raised. They were also raised informally and formally by the Board of Selectmen. It, it's pretty simple. Uh, there's not going to be a project if you can't get through the pre-design phase period. So the advice and counsel that we received was to limit ourselves to the pre-design phase and then if you look at number five, GCC will, depending upon public response, proceed to work with the town to determine if and how such facilities should be built and the terms and conditions of ownership and operation. And GCCC is open-minded about how that be done. Mr. Kremick. I, I appreciate I appreciate that. Um, the town, it's a town-owned facility, and there'll be su significant um, town involvement. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, as you said, you're a private you're a private group, and I know that you have some people involved with your group that are involved in, in, in town government in one form or another, but not when they're acting with your group. Um, I don't understand the point you just made. Would you repeat that? The point that? is, Irv, that normally when, when someone comes to us with a project to, to our board, it is, uh, it is an official town uh, project. And they'll come to us, like Parks and Rec will come to us and say, here's a plan for, for uh, dealing with the uh, Eastern Greenwich C Civic Center. They've done that twice. And what's happened? Nothing. Right. 
and they'll have to come again for this board and for the other town boards to take any action. Remember, this is a town facility. One, I, I think it's a great, I think it's, it's a great service that your private group is doing to see uh, if, um, if you can move the process forward. And, and I'm not trying to discourage you from that, but it's a town facility, it's, it's a public, uh, use the facility whatever facility we do there is going to be for public use and it's got to be before town boards act on it there has to be um, something initiated by a town probably the board of selectmen in this case in terms of how to use the town facility that would be my judgment that's that's always been our understanding not only with this administration but with the previous administration. And what I'm saying is your private group may not be determining how this public facility is used. You can certainly give input. You can certainly give information. You can certainly uh, give money or at least propose to give money. But then ultimately somebody from the town has got to take it up, whether it's Parks and Rec or, or whatever. I, I, can't, I can't debate that with you. Uh, because I'm not in a position where uh, I can debate it with you. I go back to what I said about number five. If you read number five very carefully, that says that once the pre-design phase was done and we, we have something to look at, we have something tangible to look at, that when it comes to uh, if and how the facility should be built and the terms and conditions of ownership and operation we're open to. We're scratching new ground, okay? I, 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 I must say, because I feel strongly about this, that the only initiative relative to this has been made by a private group. If you look at the effort that was made uh, to refurbish uh, using synthetic turf on high school fields when the town had neither the money nor did they have fields which they could turf with natural turf. Uh, the creativity of a private group caused a public facility to be turfed, synthetic turf. And that added to the capacity significantly of town fields. I don't see this as any different than that. I don't see it any different, personally, I don't see it any different than uh, the, the Senior Center for the Arts. I don't see it any differently than uh, Bruce Museum. Those are all, or were, town-owned facilities where the town was not able to be responsive to the needs of the community, and a citizen group stepped forward and found the answer and came back to the town and worked with the town and found uh, an a, a, an appropriate uh, solution. So I don't see this as any different. There are precedents, Mr. Crummick, where public-private partnerships have been able to do what you're suggesting, and we're not suggesting we're going to be any different. Mr. Simon, Mr. Finger, and then Ms. Tarkington. I think, you know, our agenda item was a presentation of your activities. I think you've laid them out. I think one through five don't depend upon the town doing anything. I think this board, as Mr. Crummick says, only acts upon requests from town departments, not individual groups. Um, and what happens with this building will not be determined by us until we get input and requests from town departments. We don't initiate projects. And we're not, no one's going to, at least I'm not going to vote on anything. And the, t the town departments have to do the projects. The town departments have to want to be doing this in partnership with you. You can do items one through five. That doesn't involve the town at all. That's right. That's the reason they're written that way. Right. So, you know, you don't need us to do anything with one through five. You can go off and do them. But you need, unless the town parks and rec says this is what we want to do, this is unless building and maintenance say this is what we should build, this board is not going to appropriate any money. And this is the function of our board, essentially, is to appropriate money for projects. Um, we were not asking you to appropriate any money. What That's we were doing... That's all we do is appropriate money. Okay, then maybe, maybe I shouldn't have come. Uh, but we felt that for 
based upon the initiative that you took, this board took, to say that a $750,000 investment for a new roof was not a prudent investment. And to have that facility sitting there, sitting there, dying on the vine, okay, uh, you know, maybe you didn't ap appropriate any money for us, but the fact is that you chose not to appropriate any money for that facility, even though those same departments that you're talking about made that recommendation to you. So that was a signal from, from our perspective, right or wrong, a signal from our perspective that you didn't see it as prudent to move forward with that facility. Am I wrong? But I find it inappropriate to have a debate from this board with one individual over this topic. Well, I think relative to the commentary, and we'll get to Mr. Finger, I think, it's, I, think, I think the presentation is helpful. I think it's an important enough issue that merited a great deal of debate during the budget process. Um, and, and involving a, a building that we know has a relatively short lifespan for the presentation to be made and to advise our board as to what your group is doing vis-a-vis -vis, um, trying to determine a solution for this facility. And so I think to that end, it's been a very productive Helpful. conversation. Okay. Beyond uh, that, I don't think we can go beyond that. I, I agree with Mr. Simon. We can't go beyond that. You should not be debating this issue with one individual. You shouldn't be. If, if, if we had an assessment from the town, which we paid for, and it said this is what we think we need in terms of a new facility, if, if, if we had that assessment, which we don't have, we had it in 2006, we don't have it today, it might be a different environment because then you were talking about what the town said their needs were. And certainly through the whole process, based upon the discussion with the Board of Selectmen, uh, the the uh, the first selectman asked Mr. Siciliano if he had any uh, comments relative to what the initiative was before they voted on the five points, and Mr. Siciliano simply said, "We would like very much to have uh, a seat at the table and participate in the process." And we said, "Absolutely." Mr. Finger. Okay. What I heard in the beginning of your presentation was that you were looking, f you, you went out to, to private sources to try to raise money to help you jumpstart the needs assess, the new needs assessment. You went to 70 individuals and you got a response, a positive response between zero and two. And it sounded like the response of the other 68 to 70 were that, was that they, somewhat influenced by what happened with the um, Havemeyer Building, Board of Ed Building, and the um, Performing Arts proposal. One thing that I would point out to you, which you could point out to those, is that unlike that situation, which was a, a proposal for a totally different use of a town building that was already being used by a town department, where another town department had interest in using the building, I don't think that whatever may or may not happen with this building, mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say that if something does happen, it's going to be along the lines of a community center somewhat like serving the similar purposes as it, currently, as it currently serves. And there's a distinction, again, distinction between performing arts and this building. So maybe those individuals would take a step back and say, well, the town is not looking for something other than a community center, and, and your group, Earth, is, is talking to them about helping you do a needs assessment that is along the lines of a community center. Maybe there's a, there's, this should give them some level of comfort. And I know in a previous public service that I did in the town on the Board of Parks and Recreation, uh, the board at that time was supportive of the notion, putting aside governance issues, the Board of Parks and Recreation at that time was supportive of, of a group, a friends of group such as yours, trying to come up with ideas to improve that facility. Um, hopefully that would be somewhat persuasive in, in going back to those 70 people, maybe getting more than zero to two to um, be willing to, to put up some seed money. Um, I can. I, I don't want you to be surprised. We've taken the initiative uh, with the print media 
to um, indicate that if something is going to happen to the Eastern Greenwich Civic Center, it requires the help of everyone in town, basically pointing to private individuals that uh, the town is not in a position today to uh, financially support uh, this kind of initiative. And maybe that's a judgment call, and maybe we have to reorient our priorities. But that's the thrust of, of what we'll say, and that in part comes from the decision that you took relative to the roof. Okay. To the notion that um, this presentation has been helpful not only to this body but hopefully to those who are watching give an update as to where you are um, and that if there are members who are interested in this topic that they should be in touch with your committee um, to see what they can do on an individual basis as to how to how to move the process along mr. Chairman. mr. Campbell yeah, I just before we concluded I just wanted to offer up some words of encouragement to you I it's uh, Procedurally, this might not be the ideal place to be uh, before the BET right now, but I think that there are many of us uh, who are supportive uh, of progress being made on a community center, a, a revamped, a revised, uh, if it's not a new community center in the eastern part of Greenwich. Uh, I grew up in Old Greenwich. Uh, I remember fondly going bowling there uh, on more than one Saturday. Um, I think it was a facility that, uh, that was very much valued in its time. Uh, and it's fallen into disarray, and I hope that something can be done. So I want to applaud you for your efforts, and, uh, and hopefully uh, there'll be good news uh, going forward. So uh, my takeaway message from you is that uh, after I leave, you'll talk about this, but is it the chairman's view that uh, the word endorsement is not appropriate? I think you've heard from this board, um, I don't think it's just my view, um, that this board is, is not going to take any action that doesn't have a financial implication to it, i.e. an appropriation or some um, mechanism by which we're approving an item. Um, and so I think you've heard from a variety of BET members who have either expressed individual support for it or concerns about some of the issues that they have. And if you do have concerns that you're just not expressing also tonight regarding any of the five points, I would ask that you get in touch with Mr. Porter or Ms. Sadakan. Uh, but that you should neither take an endorsement or um, uh, a vote of no confidence. It's simply that this body um, is, is not in a position to render a judgment as to your plan of action. All right. If that's, if that's the board's view. I, if, if anybody that disagrees with that least the sentiment of the board, then, then I think I've accurately reflected, I think, what, what, a, what a good number of people have indicated on this body. Yeah, you can't just briefly I mean, mr. Kremick you can't take away from this a lack of support either it's just that you you have to understand that when we're asked to appropriate money it has to be initiated by a town body so you should be talking to the selectmen you should be talking to uh, parks and rec and uh, that is the avenue uh, to come to this board for for action that's, that's what we've done, and I uh, appreciate the time that uh, you've given us to bring you up to date. Uh, I cannot predict what will happen relative to uh, those that are observing this. I can't. I can't call it. And I can't call what uh, our own board's response would be as to whether or not they deem it appropriate appropriate to go forward with a fundraising effort when the BET's position is one of ambivalence. Fair word? No. No. No? No. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I think, I think Ms. Barton just said it. Uh, I, I just think we, we've taken no position because, in fact, there's not a, an application before us. There's not a request for money. We're a finance board. And if, in fact, uh, we wouldn't pass judgment as to whether or not your plan of action is a good plan of action. One, because it's not coming through a department. Um, and so 
you will you will rarely if ever I'm not sure under my tenure that we've ever taken such a vote in terms of whether or not we've approved a process uh, for an action to ultimately come before us so I think you've heard quite frankly the opposite of individual support um, and you can uh, count the beans ultimately when this appropriation comes forward that those individuals then will vote a particular way relative to a program potentially um, but as a body uh, we have taken no action. It's not ambivalence. It's actually an affirmative vote of not taking a vote. Okay. Good. Good clarification. Mr. Raymer? It's important to me, maybe to others, that the voice that you hear ringing in your ears as you leave here were the very right comments of Jim Campbell at the other end when he said that the sentiment of this body is strongly, we want you to succeed. We just can't do today what you wanted us to do because it's not what we do. We want you to succeed and you should go out there and make that happen and come back to us in the proper way and you'll get the response that you want. Just, just so that there's not a miscommunication, there's, there are individual comments that you've heard tonight. I think you should take away from that the individual comments that you heard tonight as individuals. As a body, we took no. We took the affirmative step of taking no action right. because of our own procedure, not having anything to do with the the, the merits of your position. Okay, yep. but I think you did hear tonight. I certainly heard individual support for this as individuals. Thank you for your time. I recognize that we were scratching new ground tonight, and uh, uh, I haven't been disappointed in that respect and uh, appreciate the informal uh, comments that were made uh, encouraging us to go forward. I can't make a prediction. This is a tough, tough, tough uphill road to hoe. It really is. You all know that. Pardon? Mr. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Wait, Mr. Stone, do you have a comment on this topic? Yeah. Uh, I'd, uh, I'd encourage you to bring back to your committee uh, uh, the recollection that several of them have, I believe you may as well, uh, of this board having uh, first, I think the budget committee, and then I think it was validated by the full board, uh, turned down the request for a repair to the roof in this particular budget year. Uh, and it wasn't done without a comment that I think was probably memorialized in, uh, in some way, shape, or form that the entire, that it was not simply turned down out of hand, but with the idea that something needed to be done beyond just a patchwork on one phase of the required renovation. But we encouraged uh, essentially the Board of Selectmen to take note of a project that somehow needed to be initiated. We weren't specific beyond that point, but we did turn down something that was within our power to approve, the idea that more needed to be done than simply a patchwork. That's helpful. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you. Is there any other items to come before us this evening? Move to adjourn. Motion made. Second by Mr. Raymer. Thank you.